Hello and welcome. This is Event Activation, a love letter to small events. My name is Sage Bandicoot. I am a project manager for Burning Man's Civic Activation Department. And today's call is the 10th call in a series called Burning Man's Global Activation Series, which is an experimental series that we started to highlight and amplify the stories of community members in different activation areas all around the globe. And those areas are arts, civics, community, grant making, ecosystems, and today's events. And so with no further ado than that, I am pleased to introduce a man who truly does need no introduction. Stephen Raspa, our Associate Director of Community Events, who's going to tell us a bit more about today's topic. Stephen, go ahead and take us away. Thank you, Sage. And hello, everyone. As we emerge from a year of not being able to host most in-person in events, and with public health and safety in mind, small events are going to be permitted again sooner than large ones. Thankfully, our community is no stranger to small events. Over the years, there have been countless tasty and fun potlucks, weekly pub nights, work parties, costumed rampages, art workshops, themed picnics, beach cleanups, and even vampire blood drives, French made moot patrols, who did that to my bike mutant art bike parades, and intimate events organized around acts of kindness, making Valentines for seniors living alone, and care packs for the homeless. So we've always done small well but it's often the big events that get all the glory. So today we're going to turn that on its head and take a moment to really express our love and deep appreciation for small events and what they bring to the world. We have a moderated panel to touch upon some of the advantages and philosophical aspects of small events. Then we'll open things up for additional questions and contributions from you, our esteemed audience. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to ask you a question. Take a moment to think about one thing that you really love about small events and gatherings. And on the count of three, I want you to drop that into chat. Okay, what do you love about small events? One, two, three, drop that word into chat. Oh, I see lots of wonderful things, camaraderie, intimacy, connections, community. Wonderful, keep them coming. Uh, I can tell already that we are going to have a very rich and varied discussion today. And now that we prime the pump a little bit, let me introduce our special guests. On our panel, we have Ali Sue Gerlach, a seasoned event producer with experience producing events from 100 people to 100,000. Ali Sue is founding producer of Chicago's Halloween Gathering and Art, Arts in the Dark Parade, and is currently working for Calapria Center for Indian Performing Arts as Director of Community Outreach. She is Vice President of Chicago Burner Nonprofit BURN, which stands for Bold Urban Renaissance Network. Ali Sue also has extensive experience working with volunteers as a volunteer coordinator in Black Rock City and beyond. Our second panelist is Hampus Lindblad, who joins us today from Sweden. Hampus is a co-founder of The Borderland, the largest official Burning Man regional event in Scandinavia. He's also a co-initiator of multiple small events, such as Afterglow, Ascension, and Urban Burns. When not organizing burns, he runs community spaces in Stockholm, the latest of which is Blevanda, which means becoming in Swedish, and is an independent cultural house for participatory art events and organizations. Lavanda just won the 2020 Civil Solidarity Prize from the European Union for its outstanding community effort fighting COVID-19. Hampus is also a new father as of two months ago. So thank you for joining us in a potentially sleep deprived state and congratulations on both counts. Our third panelist is Athena Demos. Athena has over 20 years experience with events and in the entertainment industry. For 15 years, she honed her skills volunteering for the Los Angeles Burning Man community, serving as regional contact and producing art and music events, including the Los Angeles decompression, numerous newbie orientations, a Burning Man film documentary series and monthly neighborhood burner meetups. Athena also helped to found the LA League of Arts a nonprofit organization created to foster community by facilitating the creative process. 
Athena is now pioneering online immersive gatherings in virtual reality with VRCVR and joins us today from Mexico. Bienvenidos, Athena. And our moderator for the panel today is Benson Ho. Benson is a Vancouver Burning Man regional contact and former board member of the Greater Vancouver Interactive Arts Society. He also volunteers on Burning Man's Regional Events Committee, developing tools and offering support to over 100 official regional events around the world. Thank you so much for joining us from Vancouver, Canada today, Benson, and won't you get us started? Thank you, Stephen. Great to see all these wonderful faces. I'm gonna jump right into the questions here. Um, question, uh, the first question I have is to all of our, uh, all of our panelists. Uh, what is it about small events that appeals to you? And is there something small events can do better than large ones? Uh, maybe I'll turn to you, uh, Athena. Sure. Um, I think that small events give people an opportunity to connect more deeply. I know that from my own personal experience, when I'm at larger events, I suffer from FOMO a lot more than when I'm at smaller events. When I'm at smaller events, I'll sit with someone and really connect and the conversations are deeper. And when there's a larger event, I can hear that party raging over there and that one over there and I gotta go over here and I have to see everything. So I like the smaller events for the sense of intimacy and greater connection that I get. Thank you, thank you, Athena. Uh, Alex, do you have anything to add? I'd say I would I would agree with that. I think that small events are great for engagement. I think that you know it's uh, it, there's only few live events are great because it's one of the few occasions that people are not on their devices, they're not plugged in, that they can actually interact with other humans, and I think that that's what they're great for. Abbas. Um, I would maybe try to make an analogy with. Um, left brain versus right brain hemispheres and sort of how the right brain is um, um, deals more with emotional states of the mind uh, and the left of course is more on the intellectual language side and so on and and say that for me uh, smaller events are really more about the right brain it's more about the intimacy as others have mentioned already but sort of building on those relationships and and not being distracted by what can open, often happen at bigger burns, especially Burning Man, when there's so many, there's so much eye candy and, and amazing artworks and, and so much intensity and chaos. Like it's sort of, for me, I'm more inspired maybe on, on artistically and intellectually at Burning Man, but at a small event, I'm, I can really dive inwards instead. So it's more of like out, outwards versus inwards exploration for me. Yeah, thank you so much, Hampus. Uh, so, um... Athena, I've got a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. One of Burning Man's priorities is to increase RIDE, which stands for Radical Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity. Now, large events can certainly accommodate more people and be inclusive in terms of size, but how might a small event support this goal? Ooh, that's a good question. A lot of times we think about events as the people who attend them, and we don't think about events as the people who put them on. And I think with smaller events, it gives more people an opportunity to try out leadership roles, give um, uh, leading a stage or leading a panel or leading a workshop a, a chance. The large events, there's so many moving parts that the leaders tend to lead and and there's all these things going on in the background and it's really hard for somebody to come up in the leadership. So radical inclusivity and diversity and equality, I think all of that really exists in the smaller events in the people that are able to organize them. And I, for one, love doing smaller events and I look into the community to see who can work with me, who can I train, who can I, at least with the neighborhood events that we did with all of our neighborhood meetups, I would come on and organize one or two and find somebody local that would help me out. And then next thing you know, they were just taking them over. And they couldn't do that with the decompression, which is a huge event, but they could definitely do that with their neighborhood meetups. So smaller events allows you to, to tap into folks that you might not otherwise be able to tap into. Yeah, smaller events allows you to tap into, tap into a community you wouldn't otherwise be able to tap into 
I also think that the smaller events are less intimidating. Sometimes people are introverted and uh, they get intimidated by the larger events. And in the smaller events, they feel more included because they can make more connections. And then they have a greater opportunity to take on organizing something, a little bit of a leadership role. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Hampus, um, your community space in Stockholm hosts many small gatherings and serves many different communities. Um, cumulatively, small events can have a tremendous impact in spreading culture and ideas. Can you comment on small as a strategy for social change? Absolutely. I would focus, or I would mention a few things. Um, one is that change uh, of sort of any kind really requires perseverance and continuity. Um, and that is something that is not always easy at sort of large sort of blowout events like, like Burning Man. Um, so at the smaller scale, having sort of a permanent community center, for example, uh, it, it really affords this, uh, enables this opportunity for, for, for events to happen continuously and people can come back and at, the, at their own pace sort of explore and build relationships. It's not so intense. There's not this FOMO. You don't have to accomplish everything in, in one week. It's like sort of, uh, that's, one, that's one aspect. Uh, small is often less energy intense, sort of, if, let's say you compare a marathon versus a sprint. Like I, I think uh, small is more in the sort of category of the marathon. And I think, again, that, that, that's needed for the sort of continuity and perseverance to, to really affect deep change. Like we need to physically regrow our, our brains in order to change us as people. And uh, so that, that requires repetition and continuity. Um, um, yeah, and also like small is, small is more agile. Uh, adaptive to, to change. And as we are now in a, in a period of rapid societal change, there's a lot of uncertainty going on. I think small can be a lot more um, fit in that environment. Like we, we don't, we're not sort of stuck in, in paradigms that are too big for us to change or turn around. So that's another strong um, positive for, for like something that speaks for a smaller environment context. Great, thank you, Hampus. Um, Alice, um, question for you. Um, one of the things that make a burner community event special is a focus on learning and mentorship. Um, how do you see small events encouraged? How do small events encourage this? Well, I think that um, in our Chicago region, we've been we've been wanting to um, empower people to participate. I think that that's one of the places, like in in certain regions, that you know, we want more people making art and we want more people volunteering. And I think that if you can use these small event opportunities to make that happen. Um, for years, we've been wanting to do a Burn You in Chicago where we have community artists volunteering to teach, um, to pass along knowledge and skills on, on building items to, to, to give people the, the confidence to, to bring new art to our events in the region. Um, but uh, you can also use those type of events, you know, say you can't put on your big, you know, your, your big event that you normally do right now, you could actually have a small camping trip where you have leads training, you know, people who are interested in being, being leads um, over a weekend and, and, and make it a meaningful experience for everybody. Yeah, certainly that's a, that's a great, uh, great opportunity to learn there. Um, Hampus, uh, back to you. Um, Hampus, uh, obviously a, a big issue in the world right now is uh, public health and concerns about whether people will honor safety requests and modify their usual behavior. Um, what advantages do you see with smaller events and, and public safety and are there limits to those possible advantages? Yeah, for sure. Um, there are both advantages and disadvantages to smaller events versus large events. I would say on the positive side, less people equals sort of less chaos and uncertainty. You can often apply cheaper solutions um, uh, that might not work on a sort of the grand scale. Uh, you, you will often have people that are sort of friends anyway, uh, sort of then that, that often overlap or interact in the default world. So when they meet at, at a smaller event, 
they're not really contributing much to, to the spread of, of a virus, for example, uh, or less so than if they would be a massive event with basically strangers. Um, so that, that, that speaks to the positive sides. Another one is community self-regulation. I would say like so with the tighter community, people are more uh, aware of what others are doing. They care more. They might feel empowered to speak up if someone they have met before is doing something that they feel is going against the safety regulations or something like that. But I mean, I can use that community self-regulation because that has sort of a, as a segue to the, to the negatives because that, that also has a, a, a dark side to it in a sense, um, shadow side which I would say could be a higher risk for sort of a backlash, sort of a community scapegoating or shaming sort of the, the sinner or the rule breaker that, that, that could have a much stronger um, effect in, in an in a, in a existing community rather than, you know, you're just sort of, there's the plus and the cons of, or the pros and the cons of anonymity. And uh, yeah, so, so yeah, that that's a, can be a negative in smaller events. Uh, I would say, also, there's this aspect of usually at small events, the organizers and the participants they are some very, they're part of the same community. They're, they meet, they're friends, they have established relationships. It can be harder to sort of police or enforce rules upon your friends. That's just like classical and dynamic. And I think that's also something that is easier at a large event because it's like, you know, I, I, can't, I don't have time to deal with you. There's 80,000 people in the queue behind you. Just like follow the rules, move on, kind of that thing. You can sort of hide behind that, in a sense, uh, from a personal level. For sure, for sure. Um, Athena, I'll turn to you here. Um, can you speak to small in-person events uh, with the possible large online elements? And how might a small event uh, act large and in reach? And is that a good thing? Um, it's a very good thing. but. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to my last last question because I forgot to mention, like we say events and a lot of people think of parties, but events don't have to be that. Like we organized events by building a garden at Carver Middle School. And so we had, you know, cleanup parties in it and weeding and preparing and planting and teaching. And so all of these little events, it was like 20 to 50 people were working within a community. And lots of times we had to take our community into another neighborhood in order to create radical inclusivity, that it was easier for us to go there and to be part of the whole than for, to expect them to come to us. Also, we did um, uh, film screenings. I did a six month film series where once a month we showed a documentary about Burning Man, or one of the Burning Man documentaries, and then did a Q&A panel, panel about it. So your smaller events don't have to be party with DJ and art. It can be a lot of different things. Like we did newbie orientations and that was a smaller event and we would have 15 to 20 people there. So now my, I'm just gonna segue into um, uh, VR. Um, my entire life is now in virtual reality. Uh, it's an interesting place to be. And I'm watching, especially we saw this during burn week and new years, little events, in-person events happen in conjunction with the larger. And it doesn't matter whether it's virtual like this or virtual, you know, like this. <laughs> um, however, the virtual happens, you can still have an in-person gathering in your, in your living room in a little, you know, Mexico City, those burners, they had a warehouse with no roof. And so they, they had little stalls with these and 30, 50 people could get together and try out a headset, but then they were together to discuss what it was that they experienced. So it was the impersonal connection in conjunction with the larger connection of like thousands of people in VR, tens of thousands of people in VR, um, in a Zoom room, in a Twitch stream, and whatever the format is, while you're, you know, with a few people in your living room safely in your pod or safely distancing. The, the two go incredibly well together and they give people the sense of proximity that they need. And at least in um, VRCVR, you also get that sense of proximity. We say the hugs might be virtual, but the feels are real. 
So it, it, it's a dynamic that I think will exist into the future. In fact, we are already talking to programmers exactly how we are going to bring VR and AR to the playa. That's fantastic. Thank, uh, so wonderful to hear about, about all the um, exciting things you've been working on. Uh, I, I certainly enjoyed my my uh, VR experience at, uh, during Burn Week. It was fantastic, and I'm, I'm totally new to that. Uh, um, Alex, Sue, um, one question for you. Um, sure. One of the top challenges we hear that large events are uh, facing is finding suitable large venues. Uh, how might small and frequent events help address this challenge or even help us to reclaim public space? Well, I think that even though it sounds counterintuitive, there's a lot of party science around gathering people in a small space. I think um, sometimes when you have an extra large venue, you have extra large problems. You have problems, you know, with lighting and sound and, you know, just different, you know, permitting, different, just different things that, that can happen. So I think that, you know, you can find kind of unique, rare spaces to have events if it's a smaller event. And I think that you got to think about, you know, ways that you can, you can, you know, maximize that. I think that the small event benefits you, you know, you get to meet more people, you can be closer to the action, you're closer to the art, the entertainment, whatever you, you're viewing. Um, if you are limited on budget, I mean, the uh, uh, you know, it's, it's quick setup, it's easy cleanup, um, you know, it's cheaper to put on. So, you know, there, there could be all of those things that are, that are, are, are definitely pros. Um, I think that when we were talking the other day, we, we came up with the more conversation, less coordination. And, and you know, that's not a bad thing. So I have, uh, I have one more question to ask our panelists and then we'll open up to some of the questions for you at home. So uh, if you have questions, just uh, please enter into the chat uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, come to the questions uh, in a few moments here. Um, so this question is to all the panelists. Um, um, what else do you love about small events as a way to build relationship and community? And, or do you have anything else uh, you'd like to add? Um, Abyss or uh, Athena, you know, Alice, you? Um, <laughs> there's more, much to say, I don't know, but I, I will just, I want to say something. It's not, not directly answering your question, but sure. uh, I, I find this, this time for, I mean, for Burning Man especially, but, but for, for Burns all over the world really, but I think even more so for Burning Man, um, this is a very interesting time. Like there are high stakes, but also potentially high rewards in, in this like there's so much learning opportunity and so much space opening up for growth and change and renewal and whatever so uh, I just want to sort of uh, I, I just want to mention that or underscore that and, and I think I mean just want to encourage you to those of you that work with this on a daily basis to just like uh, be open and li listen use the network that you have all the world like uh, ask questions and uh, for guidance and more experiments I just want to encourage more experiments so uh, nice to see the VR thing, but it's keep, keep on going. Thank you. I, I do, I, I read some of the, the comments in the chat and some people are still uh, very fearful about getting together. I'm, we're not, in, I, for, at least for me, I'm not encouraged people to do small events right now, but small events are gonna come back before the large ones do. And so as we look at bringing our community back together safely when it is safe to do so, and in some countries it is safe to do so, and in other countries they're still having a very terrible bloom of the virus. So as we get ready to bring our communities back together, it's doing it safely and doing it small and then bringing them larger. So while we encourage people to stay together in your pods, and slowly grow those over time when it's safe to do so. I don't think any of us are encouraging anybody to start organizing 30 to 50 to 100 person events right now, depending on where you are in the world. I mean, like New Zealand, they, they don't have any virus. They just did Kiwi burn and it was very successful. But if you're in Los Angeles, mm -mm. Can, you, you can't even put five people in a living room. So 
It just, it, it, you, you need to look at where you are and do what's safe for your community at the time, your civic responsibility. And, yeah, oh, no, sorry. And well, I was just gonna say, and I think that the part of this conversation is to kind of encourage people to not feel like everything is canceled and that everything is, is, is what it is. It's just as, you know, wherever you happen to be situated as guidelines open up, as cities open up and you, and you, and you have capacity and you know what, what, what your, what your guidelines are that, that, you know, max having these small events as a way to keep everyone, you know, optimistic and feeling good about when we can finally get together all together and celebrate in the future. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, like, there's a, we all like we all, we're all pretty tired of this pandemic and so on, uh, of course, and it it really blows on so many levels. But um, if there is something positive about this, I mean, we we can also cho choose to look at it from from the positive. Uh, and I would say, like in Scan in the Scandinavian context, for example, I, I asked a question in our Facebook group um, connected to the borderland. And uh, I asked basically like the community, so what have you been up to? What, what, can you just list like all the different microburns that have you attended or that you know of for 2020? And uh, we ended up with a count of 33 just in, in like a day or so. There might've been more, but somewhere around there. So that's, that's 33 events that have happened uh, with, you know, attendee levels, you know, from two to, to like hundred or so, but like it's, it's really quite amazing to see the the span of of, of things that have, that have crept up, and a lot of them wouldn't have happened had the borderland taken place. So this is really a, I, it's it's also something you can say for small events in general. They sort of a prototyping space, a place where the thresholds for co-creation are much lower, and and it, I think you know in a year like this when the big ones go away, it's really a time to to um, to spread the sort of the the growth capacity uh, by by enabling more to, more people to step up and take responsibilities in uh, in in a smaller context, like it's sort of a, it's a plant school, a nursery school, and I, I'm really looking forward to when this expansion and, and sort of the distribution and fragmentation can sort of swarm back together again and then and form something large, because then I think a lot of people will have leveled up on different diff in different ways. And so I'm just, I'm really uh, excited about that. So that's, that's definitely something that's good about this thing. Like this enforced kind of learning experience. Like, you know, like you, at some point you have to kick out your, the, the baby from the nest or whatever, whatever to like, they have to learn how to fly. And like th these types of events can do that. Yeah, certainly lots to look forward to. Um, I'm gonna turn to one of the questions from the audience here. Um, uh, question to you panelists is, uh, can you say more about uh, how to support radical inclusion in a small event environment? I personally think it's easier to have radical inclusion in a small event environment. But if you're um, like most of my event production happened in Los Angeles and we're very much like this is the you know, cultural neighborhood of this group and a cultural neighborhood of that group. And it's somewhat mixed and diverse in certain areas, but it's pockets. And we would go to a neighborhood and do an event and then go somewhere else and do a garden or do whatever and invite the community in. So we created radical inclusivity by uh, creating a, a open atmosphere that was walking distance from their home. So we just made it really easy to, to get together. And we created 17 different Facebook pages, uh, each one for a different neighborhood. And then those neighborhoods organized um, and we helped organize around those little neighborhood meetups so that it was easier for everybody to get to the events. And then we did, you know, the big events, the overnight camping events and the decom events. And those were in an area that could house all those people. But um, it was the small events that were always my favorite. I would like to add something there. Um, just a thought, I mean, I, this is a very, like, it's a bit of a, I'm really not the right person to talk about this, given that I, I'm at my events, I'm sort of at the center of things. And I'm sort of, there's so many, I'm privileged in that sense that I, I never feel 
excluded or, or, or so on. Um, but uh, in talking to others and, and, and using the board as an example, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's always the case. I think I mentioned before, like sort of the, the, the pros and the cons of anonymity, like people often, you know, they leave their hometown or small village to move to the city to like sort of gain um, the sort of the protection from that anonymity that the large city uh, provides. And I think Burning Man or like rather Black Rock City in a sense does that for, for a lot of people, I think. Um, that's, that's what I've sort of sensed. Uh, and, and, and whilst the smaller events, definitely they're much more tribal, but again, that's a double-edged sword. If, 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 you're, if you're still feeling left out in such a tight-knit community or like a small tribal environment where everyone seems to know everyone and like then, then the loneliness or the exclusion really strikes you, at, you know, deeply. Whereas at Burning Man, it's sort of like everyone's sort of like running, and like you, no one really, you don't have the same maybe sense of entitlement or ownership usually, I mean, just to generalize there. And it's kind of easier to blend in the crowd and to, it's not so much in your face uh, at Burning Man as in a smaller event, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, I would, it's really a complex issue and I wouldn't say either or. I think the only thing that I would add is I think that sometimes when you go to a larger event and you go with a group of your friends that you hang out with that are your people, when you're at a large event, you tend to actually be more clicky because because you don't want to lose them. Like so you end up going from one area to the next to the next next with the same exact people that you came there with. But if you're in a small venue, if you're at a small event, you're not going to lose your friends. So you can like leave them and, and go meet people and, and 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 really, you know, make the most of that experience. I think that 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 can be a different thing, too, where you, you know, you find yourself, you know, getting out of your your, your comfort zone and, and meeting people and and making other people feel more welcome because you're you're not worried about losing your people. So. Yeah, absolutely. definitely, definitely experienced that myself. For sure. Um, another question we have from the audience here, uh, and this was on my mind as well. Um, how do you manage tickets when demand exceeds safe capacity? Um, you know, I, I think I think with all that's happening, there's a lot of thirst for our events. So as we're coming back online with some smaller events. How do we sort of balance that piece with sort of being inclusive still? How do you how do you manage that piece? Any ideas here? Um, I would say that in, in, in our experience here, um, I don't know. I think it's a mix. I, I think a lot of uh, organizers they basically, in a sense, put radical inclusion a bit on pause or like they de-emphasize that. So like a, a lot of these some of these some of these events have not fulfilled like all the criteria there hasn't been like invite only events or you know like stuff like that um so that's one aspect the other one would be i think which is common to sort of given sort of the, the complexity and sort of a, this, this is a tricky thing to solve um uh usually you would you would um fall back on sort of first come first serve and just like you know that because that sort of evens it out in more or less Uh, yeah. Athena, uh, Ali, Sue, anything to add? Um, yeah. Well, I believe. Just... Okay, we've been selling out. Uh, when I say we, Los Angeles, but I retired from Los Angeles three years ago, four years ago. Um, but we've been selling out events for years and years and years and years and years. Well, the way we approach radical inclusivity isn't that we're trying to get an an under uh, represented racial or, or religious audience into the event. It's a duocracy. Those that do will get access to the tickets first. Those that volunteer, those that help out, those that work, we need them in the event and therefore they get the first round of ticketing and then whatever, this is the approach that we've done and then whatever doesn't sell in that round of the people that are building theme camps and art installations and and doing all the building and creating, then it goes out into the public sale. Uh, and we found like, at least with Bequinox, um, uh, I, I would say three quarters of the tickets go to the duocracy and a quarter go to public sale. And there's always a group of tickets that are saved for the local community. 
that go to those that live in the area where the event is. And we always did that with DCOM, which would be Chinatown and East LA and downtown LA. And we always sectioned off a group of tickets that were specifically for the people that lived and worked around the area where we did the event. And that was how we handled radical inclusivity. Now, since as when we start coming back, those events are gonna be smaller and smaller and smaller as we can safely, slowly build out the events. And what I encourage everyone to do is add a virtual element. It can be social immersive VR. It can be what we're doing right now. But if you add the virtual element to your live event, you can actually reach a global audience. You're no longer location-based. You can have people from China at your event from their living room, which is exactly what we had with VRCVR. I met people from China and Australia at the same time. I would be sitting around talking to people and they would be like, oh, I'm in Germany or I'm, I'm in uh, uh, Norway or I'm in Hong Kong right now. We have these conversations on Playa because we meet people from all over the world. And so I was again having these conversations except for those people that are from all over the world are actually physically in those countries while I'm having these really great in-depth conversations. So the combination of VR and physical is what is going to allow us to have that greater radically inclusive audience. Ali C, do you have anything? No, I think I think that she covered it. I and they both did. I, think. I can just add one little tidbit from the borderland. Obviously, it didn't happen. Uh, it didn't happen last year, but um, probably won't happen this year. But um, we we have since many years. Uh, utilized uh, a lottery basically for our tickets, which we call memberships because they're actually technically also member memberships in an association. So it, we have this uh, hybrid system of you sign, up, you sign up, you register for the lottery, and then you know, at a certain point you get uh, an email whether you won or not. And then if you, if you didn't, you put on the reserve list. And then basically the system uh, sells these, uh, assigns these the memberships uh, in waves, but it's combined with, um, with um, sort of like there has an as a component of conscious nepotism or something, whatever you can call it. Like so, in order to not because lottery, of course, it's based on chance and randomness, and if that can also be fragmentary, like like most people want to tend with a friend or a spouse or something. Um, so in order to have a, a combination of strike a balance between the connectivity between the participants and the radical inclusion aspects of, of the lottery, then there, there is this thing that if you get a chance to buy a membership, you also get to invite one other person. So you get basically a plus one. I like that term, conscious nepotism. Mm -hmm. And I, it, you know, I love I love the concept when you're thinking about having a small physical gathering and you combine that with that uh, VR or uh, uh, virtual platform as well. So you can really expand that while keeping it physically small. Um, so I have uh, another question here from the audience. Um, do you have any tips or ideas on encouraging meaningful online engagement? Um, my community seems to be sick of online events and participation is at all time low. So we're getting sort of Zoom burnout. Yes. I, I agree with Zoom burnout. I have Zoom burnout. <laughs> and, um, uh, but I, I don't have uh, social immersive VR burnout but I do have a Zoom burnout. A combination of the two, um, the platform that we're on for VRCVR allows for PC, Mac, and, uh, and VR headsets. So, and you can stream content from a 2D platform, such as Zoom or Twitch into the platform so that you can watch a panel such as this while you're hanging out with friends. Um, and it tends to be less of a burnout. So if you're gonna go onto a, an online platform, one of the social VR platforms uh, tends to have less burnout than say a Zoom. And scientifically, they believe that's because on a Zoom call or whatever, you, you see all these people and it's just one after another after another, but only one person can talk at a time. So there's a lot to pay attention to and, uh, with a, a single stream. Whereas once you get into you know, something like this 
or you use it on your computer, you, 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 it's more organic. You can go off to this corner and talk with this group. You can go on that corner, just like you would at a party. It's just like that. And you're, you're not honed into this screen where you have to hold focus. So, but, but again, it's a combination. Um, how much of the pieces? I add just saw the, that question. They're, they're yeah, no, I might add, you know, the, the v, for the VRC VR platform, I use that for, I didn't have one of those headsets. I just use it on my laptop and it still had a great immersive experience. So mm -hmm. it's not, uh, it's not necessary. I'm sure it would have been a lot better to have it, but I had a great time yeah. regardless. Yeah, you don't, you don't need a headset. Um, sometimes I tell people to get one headset and share it amongst friends, but you can do it on a PC or a Mac. And if you just go to our website, brcvr.org and click on get started, all the instructions are there. And, um, and, and we do, we're in there all the time. It's not just burn week. We're in there all the time, all the time. So come find me, I'm Aunt Athena inside. I was I was gonna say here in Chicago, people have done some creative ideas to kind of mix it up. We were doing Burning Man happy hours, you know, that people were logging into. But then I think that you know now people have gotten into doing rec room type things where they have trivia nights or they have spelling bees or just ridiculous stuff just to kind of break it up and make it fun. I think that a lot of times, too. Um, if there's a performance, if everyone's watching, you know, someone from the community perform that, you know, that's 20 minutes where people aren't feeling like, you know, they have to engage other than to, than to watch an experience. So, I mean, there are many other things you can do maybe. Have to see everything, any other, any ideas or tips for us to engage online, online engagement there? It, it needs to be online specifically. Um, um, I don't know. I need, I, no, I don't have anything like at the tip of my no, tongue. So not, not really. I mean, there's so many, so many things you can do. I don't know. I, I was thinking more in terms of like, but it's so contingent on how, what the situation is in, in your location. Uh, I mean, in, in our country in Sweden, we, we have been fairly fortunate in that the restrictions haven't been as tough and we can still do kind of smaller social gatherings with up to eight people, for example, right now. So uh, I don't know, but maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't just waste time talking, but like, I would also take this time to, to uh, maybe plan for like the future. Like I, I'm getting a lot of energy uh, planning for like the Norona party we're gonna throw out here on the parking lot outside when, when, the, when it's over. Like you can also sort of, the same way we sort of uh, you can get you can get energy from reading about exotic places that you want to travel to whatever like when you're at home in, in a sense try to try to make the future better now by you know uh, what's, uh, sorry uh, you know uh, what's it called uh, leveling up basically like learning new skills like own, owning the things you need to own in order to to make make the future better. I mean, more fun when you get there. Sorry for ranting. <laughs> no problem. Uh, we do have a few minutes left. Uh, 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 so if anybody has uh, more questions or wants to chime in on a particular topic, uh, we certainly can open it up a bit for the audience. Um, I wonder if, uh, is Doxy still on? Doxy, mm -hmm. there you go. I have a question for you, Doxy. Um, Sorry to spring this on you last minute here, but uh, I know that you and your community have done many homeless uh, care pack making social workshops. And um, do you think those small workshops would scale to thousands of people or is it maybe good to keep them small? Wow, trick question. Um, <laughs> I would prefer them not to scale to large. Um, which when we, you know pre times pre COVID times like the most we would have at an event would be two hundred people and it doesn't seem like a lot of people people but when you've got that many things to do, um, and I just posted in the little window, we're actually we've actually still packed um, two hundred backpacks with seven people, and it was nerve wracking for me. I almost lost it. This weekend we're doing it differently with separate rooms. Everybody's coming into a house from a different door. They have their room to pack, and we're packing three hundred backpacks, and then. We've set up an event where people are coming to pick up those backpacks and then get them out onto the streets. 
So it's just a different way of trying to engage. I mean, the great thing about the BWB Backpack Project is there are so many access points. There's so many ways to contribute and get involved that, ha you know, some people never see other humans. Some people, that's all they want to see are humans. So there's there's varieties. Thousands of people involved. Woo, woo. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, so um, thank you so much, Doxy. I, uh, that your, your backpack project is, is quite inspiring. I remember hearing about it uh, at uh, one of the GLCs way back in the day and how it's, it's actually, we brought that idea back to our community. It's super inspiring. Um, so at this point, I'm just looking at our Q&A here, and I don't think we have any further questions that came through the chat. Um, so, I, and is there anybody who, uh, any of our panelists or any of our audience members who have anything they'd like to add or any, any comments? Well, somebody just put in the chat that they were wondering about bringing people in from outside of the burner community. Like we tend to be insular, we, we know our burner community, and it's hard to reach out beyond that and bring people in. Uh, it's going to be a little harder now with COVID because people are going to be uh, um, resident. Uh, re what's the word I'm looking for? Resistant. They're going to be cautious. That's the word I'm looking for. They're going to be cautious about getting into a new community. I can, however, speak to VR. And I would say at least half, if not more, of the people that I am now running into in VR, CVR have never been to Burning Man or can't go or have never been to a regional event, or they don't have a regional in their area. And right now I'm starting to meet people, shocker of all things, that have no idea what Burning Man is and have never heard of it before. I, To me, that seems incredibly odd, but we're running into people more and more and more as people are jumping onto the platform and they're like, wow, this is amazing, this is so cool. What is this? And I'm like, this is Burning Man. And they're like, what's Burning Man? And, and so at least because it's so safe to be in VR, you know, you, you don't have to worry about somebody breathing on you or coughing on you or, you know, touching something that, that you're in your own home and you're at your own computer or you're on your headset. And because of that, I think people need to socialize and they're running into that direction. And so we're getting this grand, bigger community of people in, and, and they're going to come to the regionals. They're going to come find the virtual event. I mean, the physical events, but they're going to find it through the virtual. So I think virtual is also a way of branching out outside of the known burner community to bring people in. And then when we can go to the physical, you now have this virtual audience that you can talk to and say, hey, we have this little physical event. This physical event is getting a little bit bigger. A couple, you know, a year from now, it's like, hey, we're going to do this event and they're part of your your community so use virtual to build community thank you athena so i'm just looking at the time here we're kind of we're nearing uh the end of our uh official hour here so i'm just gonna um uh pass uh, this back to raspa for a few minutes here as we try, start to wrap up our hour here thanks benson uh so Earlier, we asked everyone, what do you love about small events? And uh, we took those answers and made a little word cloud. I think that Sage can put that up. Sage, do you want to put that up? Great. We've got intimacy, people, lots of intimacy, uh, connections, uh, fellowship, accessibility, easier. Um, that you know people forever, camaraderie, potential for greater participation, all great things. Um, thank you so much. I want to uh, say that we've reached the end of our formal program, but we can continue with informal questions and discussions for those who can stick around for another 30 minutes. Um, but um, I want to thank Benson and our panelists, our production crew, and all of you joining us to celebrate the very big impact that small gatherings have. For those of you that need to sign off, thank you for joining us. And please use the sign-in sheet in chat to receive a video of this call if you would like one. Thank you again for joining us. We wish you, uh, all of you, very fun, inspiring, and safe community gatherings, whether they are big or marvelously 
small.